Are you looking for wisdom, courage, and guidance on your journey as a change maker? Grab your headphones, a warm drink, and possibly a notebook. You're going to want to take notes. You found your new favorite podcast. Welcome to Become a Good Ancestor, a podcast hosted by Layla Saad. Layla is a New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author, an international speaker, and a globally respected teacher on the topics of race, identity, leadership, personal transformation, and social change. In each episode, Layla interviews some of the world's most inspiring authors of color who are changing the world with their words. From memoirs to manifestos, poetry to pop culture, science, to social justice, and everything in between. Join Layla as she dives deep with BIPOC authors who are showing us the way to healing and liberation. This is a place for people who wanna help change the world, in honor of those who have come before us, and in service to those who will come after we are gone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 10 of Become a Good Ancestor. I'm your host, Leila Saad, and this is the place where inner work meets social change. Today, I am very excited because I have been wanting to do this episode for more than a year. Um, Today, I'm speaking with artist, poet, theologian, and community organizer, Trisha Hersey, or as you may know her, the Knapp Bishop. Trisha is the founder of the Knapp Ministry, an organization that examines rest as a form of resistance by curating sacred spaces for the community to rest via collective napping experiences, immersive workshops, performance art installations, and social media. She is a global pioneer and originator of the movement to understand the liberatory power of rest. She is the creator of the Rest is Resistance and Rest as Reparations frameworks, and her research interests include Black liberation theology, womanism, somatics, and cultural trauma. Her debut book is called Rest is Resistance, a Manifesto, and it incites us to disrupt and push back against capitalism and white supremacy through the power of resting. This much-anticipated book encourages us to connect to the liberating power of rest, daydreaming, and naps as a foundation for healing and justice. And it is rooted in those things that she is so passionate about, the spiritual energy um, of Black liberation, of womanism, of somatics, and of Afrofuturism. We'll be talking all about rest as resistance with Trisha and with our community this month in the book club. And to find out more about the book and to join us in the book club, visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club. All right, Trisha, let's do this. Welcome. (laughs) Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited. I am so happy to be in conversation with you. I, well, first of all, let's, let's get the preliminary questions out of the way. Where can people find you? Where can people find you and your work? I mean, people, I'm on all social media platforms. And so IG, Twitter, Facebook, all of them, it's The Nat Ministry. Um, always remember the word the in front. So The mm-hmm. Nat Ministry. And then also my website, um, thenatministry.com. So those are the main places. Perfect. And then this question, which I was so excited to ask you about, because you really, your work is really rooted in deep uh, ancestral research, experience. Um, who are some of the ancestors who have influenced you on your journey, familial or societal, um, whether they're alive now, whether they've transitioned, who are some of those ancestors? Yeah, I talk about, um, I think the first person I would name is my grandmother, Ora Caston, my maternal grandmother, my mom's mom, my boo, like we were really close. She's an ancestor and she really is the muse of this work for me because she taught me how to reimagine rest. She taught me what it meant to um, be subversive and inventive and to kind of be a, have a politics of refusal and an idea of regardless, like it doesn't matter what the system say or do, I'm going to do this. And so mm-hmm. her thing was, I'm going to rest. I'm going to center my time, my mindfulness, my mindfulness. 
So she's big. I speak about her anytime I can speak about the NAP ministry, every lecture. I write about her in the book. And so Aura Caston is one of my greatest ancestors. Then I would have to name my father, Willie James Hersey, who um, really led the way in grounding me in a liberation lens around Blackness. He was um, deeply into Pan-Africanism, Black liberation, the Black Panther Party. You know, he was a a Black preacher in um, Black Pentecostal tradition, um, Church of God in Christ. He was an activist, union organizer, you know, preacher. So he was always leading the charge from the time I was very young to letting me know that no matter what the system say, no matter what they say, you are um, a child of God and you are highly, highly regarded. Um, You're held, you're um, centered in in this world and everything else is a lie. And so that deep um, lens of my blackness not being criminal and not being something that was to be looked at as um, something negative, but it was the greatest asset I could have as a person in this world. And so I uplift him so much. He's a um, amazing, was an amazing preacher, fire and brimstone preacher, singer. Everyone knew him and loved him. When he did die, over 500 people were at his funeral. It was um, really, um, even to this day, people still talk about him. Like, I'll go home to Chicago and um, I might go to a, like a bank or something where he used to bank at and they see my last name. And they're like, do you know Willie? And I'm like, that's my dad. And they're like, oh, we loved him. And so he really was a community activist at heart. He believed in total community care. So those two together, um, my those ancestors, my family ancestors are the greatest. I would say outside of them, definitely Harriet Tubman. Um, I speak about her greatly in the um, book. Harriet Tubman in her trickster... Um, resting, <laughs> creating a way out of no way self, uh, fugitive, maroon. I really um, look to her to be one of the greatest um, ancestors and greatest movement leaders for when I think about a rest movement. So when we think about this rest is resistance movement, there is no rest movement in this whole entire world without Black people. If, if it doesn't include Black people and Black uh, scholarship, and Black uh, liberation, the thoughts of Black liberation, then it's not um, a rest movement. It's incomplete. And so she is, I think, the muse for that idea, for a person who um, really censored the idea of connecting. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. As you were speaking about your grandmother and your father, it really got me thinking about how important it is to our children for what they see us do and what they hear us say Um, and the imprints that that places within them and how it's so important to name things directly, call out the bullshit directly, name the systems directly, right? Name the truth directly. And that that becomes almost like encoded as part of their DNA. Like you wouldn't be who you are, the way you are, if not for you know, your 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 grandmother, your father, what they did and what you heard them say both to you and to other people. And it's just, it's so powerful when we think about becoming good ancestors to not, um, to not think that that means that you have to have been some great public figure. Right. 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 Like without, without them, there would be no nap bishop. There would be no not nap at all. ministry, right? And not at all. It's right. powerful to think about it. And then when when you were talking about Harriet Tubman and and rest, I think so often when we think about Harriet Tubman, we don't think about her with the word rest. We think of all that she did, all that she achieved, and her constantly running right back and forth oh, yeah. um, to mm-hmm. to bring people out, to bring them to safety, and the amount of maybe urgency, like an energy of urgency, maybe an energy of fear, maybe, you know, all survivorship. When you say rest, I'm like, wow, yeah, like we don't think of her like that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I I really want to kind of dig into where maybe activists and change makers run themselves with that energy of urgency and there's so much that we need to do and we, you know, right. and they don't give themselves that space to rest. Yes. 
And I think that's at a, it, it becomes something so negative to not do that. And so when I think about Harriet Tubman, when I study her and really read her narratives and, and read what was left behind and documented about her, she was running, like you said, on the Underground Railroad, but she was very, very subversive and very, very um, inventive and flexible about what she was doing. But at the end of it all, she knew it was freedom or death. There was no other way. So it's kind of that irregardless idea. Like my grandmother, it doesn't matter what the culture around her was going to do to her. It was going to be She's running from Jim Crow terrorism in the South. She's working these jobs. She's dealing with um, all of the racism of being in Chicago and in poverty. But it didn't matter. None of that mattered because I believe Blackness and my idea of the Black church um, really sits in this idea of I am in this world, but I'm not of it. Yeah. Like, and so I live here. I'm, I'm, a, I'm I live here. This is where I'm landed, where God placed me, but I'm not of it. I don't belong That's to these it. systems. Capitalism can't have me. White supremacy can't have me. They can do all of that. But my joy does not come and I don't belong to them. And so I think Harriet Tubman really sits in that idea of this politics of refusal. And I was reading about her and how all of these documentations about her stopping while she was on these routes to get people to freedom and to safety, how she never was caught. And I was like, wow, this woman in the in the terms of Western society, she couldn't read, but she was reading the stars. She was a very, very master astronomer, master bird watcher. She could listen to bird sounds. She could listen to nature. She was listening to the earth. And so her following the stars, her following the North Star, her following the Freedom Star to get to where she needed to go in I was learning that she stopped along the way to pray. Like she would get to a certain point around the river. Do we go left or do we go right? Do we take it this way or that way? She was mapping out all of these different routes to get people to freedom in different states and how she was doing that basically on intuition. Yeah. You know, um, following the stars, letting us knowing that if we go this way, we'll be okay. And I think about how urgent it must have been, you know, for her to have such a bounty on her head, white men trying to kill her, the dogs were on her. There was posters, if you find this woman, murder her, you know, and how she was never caught on all these different routes. How how in tune with yourself, your body, how in tune with the creator, how in tune with the stars and the birds and the earth. I learned about um, how she and the people who were on the Underground Railroad with her would use trees and nature to um, be able to survive. So they would know a certain tree on this way that they use, the, if they hit the tree on this side, that that would be a marker for the rest of the people, how they would use herbs and different trees and plants that they knew about to be able to silence the children, let them sleep so that they wouldn't cry while they were on the, on the ground railroad. All of these people who were so in tune with the earth and to be in tune with the earth, you have to stop. Yeah. You can't be rushed. You can't be urgent. You have to listen. You have to be silent. And so when I think about her slowly moving her way and taking her time and being very um, inventive and very um, concrete about what she was going to do, um, knowing that this was the way they were going to do it. It was no one's going to stop them. And then I think about this idea. I read about her falling asleep. She was in a sleep and she had a dream and it's documented. She woke up from this dream and she started screaming, my people are free. My people are free. Mm. She was saying this pre them being free. Mm. This was the prophetic statement, a prophetic word for her to proclaim in the now that my people are not going to be free, but they're free now. And so this prophetic dream that told her um, that we were going to get our freedom, you know, that the emancipation would come, that this was going to happen, to act like you're free now, to be not just act like it, but to really be embodied in a movement of freedom that I'm free now. It doesn't matter if slavery is still raging around me. You know, they hadn't... the. Um, Juneteenth hadn't come, you know, they hadn't put out any type of word. They were free. But did that matter to them? Because they're not of that world. I mean, I'm in my own world. I've created this third space, this freedom space. And so I love this idea of my people are free, this prophetic in the present tense. Yeah. You know, we're not going to, we're free now. And so I think about that in her the fact that she woke up from a dream and she was dreaming it. And like that's like the major idea. The fact that she did have a disability and did, you know, have a brain injury that had her falling in and out of um consciousness and sleep. But to think that she was dreaming, that the word came to her in a dream. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think when I think about this framework is that 
the ideas, the inventive um, imaginations, what we're waiting for to be able to get ourselves to our next level of liberation is waiting for us in a slow down state. It's waiting for us in a dream. It's waiting for us in a nap. It's waiting for us while we're listening to the stars and listening to the birds and the earth. It's not going to come to us in an urgent, exhausted, burnt out manner. And that's the lie we've been told is that the more we go, the more we do, that we'll get there quicker. But it's actually the opposite. That's right. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. And it resonated so hard because that's my personal framework as well, that I'm not, you know, I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. You know, there's, there's the yes. universe and then there's my personal universe. There's the world out there and there's, there's my inner world. And I choose to live now, not as what the world sees me as when they see a black Muslim woman, but what I know myself to be. Um, and it's so powerful to live it now and to not wait for freedom to come, for someone to give it to you, for someone to tell you, okay, it's time now, we, we've allowed it, right? I don't know that in my lifetime, if that, if that time is going to come, and I only have this life, right? I only have this life. And I think what your work is doing, and I want to talk a little bit about how the NAP ministry came to be and how the rest is resistance framework specifically came to be, because that's what your book is about. But what you're role modeling is how to live the world we want now and not wait for it yes. to be given to us by yes. those who benefit from the current paradigm. Exactly. That's right on point. That is it. I have people come to me all the time like, we got to wait for the systems to make space for us to lay down and we got to help. The government has to get involved and we got the organization. No, nah, they don't never have to um, step in because that's not the framework. That's not the praxis. The praxis is experimentation and the praxis is in the now. And so the framework and the whole idea of the net ministry and the rest is resistance idea came to me. Uh, just from personal experimentation. I was a curious, exhausted black woman and I was, what was happening in my life was not being, it was not working. It was causing me great stress, the urgency, the rushing, the working three jobs, the go, go, go. I could not keep up with the pace. And so I began to experiment. I began to experiment with resting. I began to experiment with napping and dreaming. And what the main thing I did is I began to experiment with communicating with my ancestors. Mm. And so I speak about that in the book that I was in the archives learning about what was happening to enslaved people. I was thinking about what their bodies were going through. I was studying cultural trauma and the idea of what um, a culture goes through when it goes through a collective trauma. And my um, research is really pinpointed on Jim Crow terrorism. So I was looking at Jim Crow in the American South and... We talk, we hear about it all the time. We know about the lynchings. We hear a little bit about it. But I was really interested into like what was happening on a bodily level, on a somatic level to the survivors of that. Like what was it like to survive something like that? My grandmother was a survivor of that. She saw lynchings in Mississippi. She, like millions of other Black people, she left during the Great Migration with this hope and dream of getting out of the South and going North, going West, you know, going to these different places all over the country. And and so it really was me just coming to a let the chips fall where they may moment, a radical leaping. I mean, I jumped from one mountain to another because I have faith as my wings. Mm. You know, I was like, I have radical faith. Like, I, I trust myself and I deeply trust God and I trust God to make space um, for my talents and gifts, for God to fill in mm. the gaps, for the gaps to be filled in from the ones that I was about to create because I was about to say no more. I can't do this mm. no more. And so I had to really trust and experiment with the rest. And I just began sleeping everywhere. I literally, it was not no theoretic thing where I was like, let me go and get into a book. I literally took my body <laughs> and laid it down. You know, I slept and I rested wherever I could. I missed classes. I was in a seminary and graduate school in a very, very intense program. I started just coming to school for the attendance credit. If I did something in class, I didn't turn. I was just like, I'm just here. I let my, um, I let all of my professors know. At this point, all you can do is pray for me because <laughs> there is no helping me. God got to help. But you know, and so they were like, "Okay, Trish, you know, we know that you're a good student and yeah. you try." So I'm like, "I'm here." But I just started napping outside in the mm -hmm. quad. 
in the library where I worked, I had all these little spaces around campus that were my like my spaces, couches that I had found in different buildings that I would just sleep and rest. I started resting at home. Instead of doing homework, I would lay down with the book on my chest that I was supposed to be reading 500 pages that night. Who I wasn't going to be able to do that, but maybe I could just lay it on my chest and it would, it would telepathically osmos through my body. And I just started waking up and feeling better. Like over the course of a semester, through this intense rest practice, um, I was having dreams um, that was letting me know that this was actually helping. I was feeling better. Things in my, I started to make better connections in school. I was getting grades on papers and I didn't know how. I was like, I study. I don't remember writing that. I would get papers back and had a B on it. I was like a quiz. I passed the quiz. How amazing, you know, because I did not study for that. But what I was finding out when I was studying all of this is that neurology, the neuroscience of sleep was also at work. There was also spiritual things happening to me at work. But the neuroscience tells us when we're learning so much new information, you have to sleep. Your brain cannot process it. So I was doing these things and, and find out later how they were coming to coming, helping me in so many ways. And so spiritually, I began to see it as a resistance um, for me to be able to gain back the dream space stolen from my ancestors. The more I learned about what was happening to their bodies during slavery, during plantation labor, during Jim Crow terrorism, the more I got enraged, the more I felt like this is a gift to them. This is reparations in the now. This is for me not waiting on reparations to be given to me by the government financially, but this is a spiritual reparation, a reparation that's going to deepen me into letting my ancestors know they stole rest from you. They stole your dream space. They stole your um, autonomy. But I can recapture the dream space that was stolen from you. I'll give that to you as a gift. I'll reclaim it. I'll be res resurrected mm. with you in the dream space. And so I just kept sleeping with that intention and laying down and waking up and reading uh, archives as I was working in the archives. I was like in the archives every day, reading slave narratives and really hearing their stories and uplifting my ancestors who um, I knew were exhausted when they when they passed. I knew that they died from exhaustion. And so I was like, you're now in, a, in another space and I'm here. And so let me honor your body and honor you by sleeping now. Meet me in a dream, you know, tell me something in the dream, download some information to me in a dream. And they did that. Wow. Um, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how what you were saying around it was experimentation. It wasn't me going and sort of getting something theoretically. I actually put myself through the practice. I actually embodied, um, experimented, practiced, which is you know, which is a very it's an embodied thing. It's not it's not a thinking thing, and um, and and also about how so often for myself where my deepest healing has come has been in these later years of my life when I truly understood what um, uh, ra racism and white supremacy, patriarchy and sexism, um, Islamophobia, capitalism, what all of these things have done to me internally and had done to my ancestors and how a lot of what I was taking as, well, that's just imposter syndrome, or you just, you know, you're just not very confident yes. or, you know, there's just something wrong with you. When I really understood like where all of this was coming from, my like self-love journey, my self-care yes. journey became yes. something entirely different. Like you can't tell me yes. nothing, right? <laughs> that's it. That's it. Right. Because that's I know about. who it's for. Yes. It's over. Yes. yes. You know, you can't mm -hmm. tell me about yes. myself that you should think this about yourself or you should feel this about yourself. Because now I understand the deep root work that I'm doing, the intergenerational healing. And so every time I show up as myself fully, I know I'm doing it for myself and I'm doing it for my ancestors. And that is a powerful thing that nobody can take away from you. And I think that's what makes your work so powerful is that it's rooted, it's rooted in that. Um, I, I also just want to thank you because I've been following you for some time now. Like I said, I reached out to you I, it's, I was looking back in our chat history. I reached out to you on the 28th of September, 2021. 
to say, hi, uh, did I see that you're reading a book, that you're writing a book? Is that right? You know, yes, yes. <laughs> because I want. <laughs> yes, I was right in the middle of writing. Yes, <laughs> because you know we we get we have the privilege and the honor of having wonderful conversations through this podcast and through the book club with amazing authors. Um, and quite often, the process for how we get those authors is a bit like um, it's a bit spontaneous. It's a bit like I came across this thing or I've been following this person, but but. Oftentimes, I know the book is coming first, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, that would be interesting. With you, I was like, please be writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you, please, are you writing right now? Yeah. Please and write, was, because I we need was. this. And that's why yes. I've, I've been so excited. And you have mm. guided to that practice piece that you were talking about. I've really embodied that over this past year. My team knows. I will say to them, oh, I've just woken up from a nap or I was just having a nap or I'm going for a nap now. Um, and and more and more giving, allowing myself to embody the very things that you're talking about and disconnecting from the guilt that so many of us feel when we do rest. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about capitalism, white supremacy, and rest and how, because I think a lot of people don't get the connection, like, and there's a lot of trendification of rest happening as well. That's not, yes, that's not yes, connected to white supremacy or capitalism. No, they all, they all that's heard right. it from me though. You know, nobody was talking about this. I'm I, like, when you're an archivist, you're like, I'm going back yes. into the chat history to find out. Like, I'm, I am a real yes. archivist. So I know the archives will show before 2015, when I really started like, to start thinking about this work, you know, so I started seminary in 2013 and very quickly after I started, like probably a semester in, I was like, oh, whoa, I'm like really over my head. I'm so exhausted by this. And so it, the exhaustion was quick. It was, the pain seemed like it was unhuman. And I was like, how am I going to keep up with this for three years? You know, it was a three-year program. And so I really would say that I started to really, as my research came together, I started to really, um, start really thinking about this because I looked through all of my journals. I, I hand wrote all of my notes for seminary. So a lot of my classmates were on laptops and type, type, type. And I love handwriting. Like every, I have to handwrite everything. I hand wrote a lot of my book and then transcribed it just because the vibe and energy of a writing, of putting stuff on paper, of the pen, it's just like something about the physical aspect of that, that I needed. So I have tons, probably three boxes of of notebooks just from all of my classes in seminary, three years of classes full time. And I went back through them as I was like compiling stuff for the book and doing research. And I was like writing stuff in my, um, in my like notes and on the sides and the margins, like rest movement. Nap. Yeah. Playing you know, with I was words. Just, like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, yeah, I was playing around with the idea of all these soul care and I was taking all these beautiful classes in pastoral care and um, cultural trauma and womanism. And, and so all of these ideas really started to come to me slowly. And so um, I was studying Black liberation theology and womanism in school and then cultural trauma was really important to me. And so a part of all of that really began to have my eyes open to the idea of how capitalism is still um, is such a force when you talk about plantation labor. Like people think about slavery, um, transatlantic slave trade, um, the Middle Passage, plantation labor, and they're just like, oh yeah, that's that was something that happened in the past. That was um, this um, horrible sin of America. And it, that's over. They think it's over. They don't see how the connection between that and capitalism are just like together, how yeah. capitalism was was created on plantations. The experimentation for this economic system that we are under now came on the backs and bodies of black people on those plantations, making millions and millions and millions of dollars in the agriculture of cotton, you know, rice, tobacco, like without our bodies without that machine labor, none of this world will be happening right now. People seem to think that that's over. They think that cap that whole idea is over. That capitalism has morphed to something better, but it's the exact same engine that is dri that was driving that. That's driving what capitalism is now. The idea of profit over people. The idea of working a body like a machine level pace, trying to automate a body, trying to say, well, I know you work ten hours today, but you don't get off until um, for another hour. But my body's saying I need to get 
get off now, you know? And so this automation of the body, this, this connection this, um, from the body, this disconnection, yeah, this total disembodiment and disconnection to have us to begin to believe that our bodies are not our own, that we don't own our bodies, that our bodies belong to the system, to be a tool of production for it, that our entire reason for being born and being birthed and on the earth is to be a um, tool for the production of this system, to work, to labor, to do, to have a to-do list, to accomplish, to get up, to go. Like this whole idea of um, do, 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 that all comes from these the idea of plantation labor of what was happening when they were experimenting with on, on what a body could do. I was reading all the archival information about what it was for a day. Like what was a day like for a person who worked on a plantation? Like I was so obsessed with that when I was first starting to work. The work really started with me being like, I know this happened, but I need to know, I want to get inside of the head and the body and the mind of one of my ancestors what was it like? What time did they wake up? You know, what time did they go to bed? What happened when a woman was pregnant? What happened when there was a lunch break? You know, what would happen in the in the South? I live in the South. What was it like to be working outside in 100 degree temperatures? How much was 500 pounds of cotton? That was what they had to pick every day. So I began to like t- find cotton and touch cotton. And like, I wanted to hold raw cotton and feel like what it felt like. I wanted to see what 500 pounds looked like. And so I found pictures of this mound that was as high, you know, 10 feet high. That was of what you had to pick in one day. Like, can you imagine a body picking and having that much? They had to do every single day, every day. There was no stopping. There was no days off. And so I began to try to see what was the oppressor thinking when they were trying to automate a body, when they were trying to make a body a machine, how they looked at our bodies to not be our own. And so I began to see the um, what was coming together was I began to see how that was what was happening now. When I looked at capitalism now, when I looked at how people work now, when I think about people at Amazon working, you know, for 20 hours a day, dying at work, people stepping over their bodies, continuing to work. When I think about all of the high level pace of ed- our education system. And I began to think about how from the time we're born, we're pushed to do. They began to tell children very young, like how to begin to ignore your body, how to begin to not rest, how to begin to push through the word pushing through this toxic idea of uh, you'll sleep when you're dead, you know, get it now, you know, like how toxic is that? Grind to culture. Mm-hmm. Grind culture is this collaboration between white supremacy and capitalism. That's what I name it. I name uh, mm-hmm. white supremacy being a tool for in- extreme evil. And it's been using bodies for evil for centuries. It is right. a, a system that looks at a body as not a divine dwelling place. And so the spiritual aspects of it begin to pull out, like both systems are evil and violent and don't look at our bodies for what they are. They don't look at our bodies for being what they are, an extreme site of liberation, a divine dwelling place, a place of extreme power and freedom, of rest, a divine connection to our ancestors, to the divine itself. And so I wanted to begin, like you talked about this self-love journey. What this work really is about is about getting people back to their human states to be, start seeing yes. themselves as human. You talk, not a machine, to get back to your natural state, the self-love, the self-worth of seeing who you really are and how you don't belong to these systems, who you are and who you are. And so the systems don't want us to know that because if we knew what we really were and what we have and what is already in us and what was granted to us by our birth. And so that's the key. None of these things have to be earned. They were granted to us by the miracle of being born. And so to be born is a miracle. And what white supremacy and capitalism has done is slowly just pulled that away from us, pulled veils over our eyes, snatched that self-worth away from us, snatched our self-esteem and self-love away from us. And instead of having it be centered on, on us and the internal, it's been centered on what I can accomplish, what I can do, how much labor I can put out. And so when you connect your divine um, worth to how much labor you can pull out, how much you can do, that's where the trauma starts. And that's why this work is so important because it it, it illuminates the lie. It lets people say, that's a lie. That's a lie. Say no to Mm -hmm. it. 
It's that's a what I tell my it's kids all the it time, never right? True, right? It was never it was true, never right? True. Yes. When I'm trying to get my kids to understand, right, an incident's happen, and I I name it like that's a lie, right? Like they mm-hmm. them saying that thing or doing that thing, whether it's racist or whatever the thing is. They're believing right. a lie. They are in a lie. This is what the truth is, right? But it's so important for us to have those teachers like yourself to name it because so many of us as adults don't know that it's a lie. Don't don't even know that there is another way, that there is a more human state for us to exist in. Dear Good Ancestor, are you feeling inspired by our guest's amazing work towards creating social change? You're probably here because you're passionate about fighting the isms. You know the ones, racism, sexism, classism, and ableism, to name just a few. You're here to do the work that matters. And as important as that work is, I know it can also be exhausting. Trust me, I've been there too. Here's what I've learned. When we want to fight social injustice and build a better world, we tend to lead with a burning passion. And this can also lead to burnout and a vicious cycle of feeling like we're not doing enough. That's why I created Claim Your Space, our course that sets you up to be a powerful change maker without compromising rest and joy. It took me a long time to be able to claim my space in creating social change. And I want to support you in claiming your own space and help you do the work in a way that is right for you. Are you ready to start making a difference in a sustainable and joyful way? To start your journey, sign up for Claim Your Space at becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash claim dash your dash space. You name something really important in the book as well, where, you know, your work is clearly centered in in black liberation and and everything that you've named and you also explain we need all of us well rested right and capitalism and white supremacy impacts all of us can you speak to that yes i mean yeah you know this i mean this is your work you know about the whole idea of white supremacy and people believing that it only affects the marginalized it only affects the people of color and it's like actually no you know and i also believe like many of my ancestors who were freedom fighters martin luther king fannie lou hamer you know my dad like all of these people who, who let me know that no one will be free in this culture until Black people are free. Until I'm free, you won't get free. And so this interconnectedness, this Martin Luther King Jr. speaks about this mutuality, this like interconnectedness thread that runs through all of us that we cannot get away from. It is inescapable. So if you want to get away from it, it's um, impossible. So that's the thing about it is impossible to get away from the interconnectedness of our humanity. To think Martin Luther King was talking about this during right. the 50s, you know, and people, are, this individualism of our culture that believes that nothing, we everything is our own. Whatever we do is because of us. What happens to me doesn't affect this person or I don't, it doesn't affect me. No, that is another lie. So the lie of individualism, individualism, which is killing us, um, we're watching it happen right now with the pandemic and all the things that are happening right now. Like we're tied together up in this. And so my freedom is intimately tied to yours and vice versa. What does it what does it do me to be free, to have my children free, to have my community liberated? We still have to like engage with those around us who aren't free you know like unless unless we're moving to a black planet like my (laughs) man Sunra talked about which I would go to in three seconds (laughs) unless we're moving to the black planet that Sunra has um, created for us we're here on this planet we're intertwined with each other so to me black liberation is a bomb for all of humanity it is um it is a bomb for the whole world and this work is a bomb for the whole world because white supremacy and capitalism wants us all dead it wants us all misaligned it wants us all spiritually deficient in our ways of thinking because then it can manipulate then it can control then it can make us um be disconnected and so for people who aren't black um i they are intimately tied to this rest movement. And part of that is not just resting. Naps alone will not say you. This let's work talk is not about, just about okay. naps. Yeah. This is something you yes. say so often on social media. So 
break it down mm-hmm. for us, Trisha. This work is not just about yeah. naps and it's also it's about naps, right? Naps. Like let's yes, don't it get is. it twisted. It's, it's, about, it. it's about yeah. naps, yeah. right? And right. Yes. It's it's about both. It, there is there's this beautiful idea of a nuance, of this idea of layers to things, which is so beautiful for our education and for our um learning, is to understand that everything is connected in that way. And so taking a nap is not going to save you if you're still not, you know, working on yourself to uh, unravel from your um, oppressive way. So unravel from your legacy of white supremacy, from how you are an agent of grind culture, from all of the things that you need to heal from. And so a lot of people think this is a, just about naps. No, naps are one of the many tools. This work is really about decolonizing. Yes. This work is a political resistance movement. It is not a quote unquote wellness movement. Everyone, I don't talk or say self care in this book one time. Later. I don't think you you've, 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 you've don't use that word. word. You've, no, you've never used the word wellness. I use community That's care. it. Yeah. No, I don't. I use community care, communal care. I use political movement, social justice movement. Yeah. This is a movement that is deepening into our political landscape, into the ideas of who we are as human beings, how we're going to occupy the planet, because the planet also needs to rest. Like climate change and what's happening to the earth is basically because of people abusing the earth and and not letting it rest and letting it go and like abusing it and never giving it time to like heal and time to regenerate itself. And so this is a movement that goes really deep into the um, wells of of who we are as people. It goes deep into the idea of changing the world and um, it's an ethos of slowing down. It's a paradigm shift. It's a full on lifetime mind shift around reclaiming your body and reclaiming your power as your own. And so it's not just about laying down. If you're laying down and you're still a racist, a sexist, <laughs> if you're still homophobic, <laughs> honey, yeah, these naps ain't going to save you. You're going to have to go into the deep yes. wells of your healing, into the deep wells of your um decolonizing and begin to work on yourself. So this work is a mirror. You know, it's really yeah. a mirror for you to uplift, to say, how can I change? How can I be different? How can I not align myself with these systems yeah. that are causing harm to myself and to the entire world, really. What does, and I'm, I'm going to ask you this question, then I'm going to ask Rima Saman, our book club facilitator, to come on. What does a well-rested and decolonized future look like for you? What do you, because you yeah. share this beautiful so vision in the yeah. book. What does it look like for you? I have visions. I have so many visions of, like, that's literally all I spend my time daydreaming about. And so, The idea of daydreaming is such a um, massive part of this work. I have a whole um, section in the book that's just called dream, you know, so this idea of uplifting dreaming and daydreaming and how we can imagine and dream the world we want to see, how we can freedom dream and dream ourselves free. I love spending time daydreaming about what a well-rested world could look like. I love spending time daydreaming about what reparations, um, full reparations could look like for uh, Black folks in this culture and what we could be doing with that time and leisure moments. And so for me, a well-rested world looks like one in which people have full autonomy over their time and their bodies, where they're not using their time and their bodies simply to eat, simply to survive, where survival is is on the back burner and we're looking at thriving. Yes. To me, a well-rested world looks like a world that is thriving. I don't F survival. I was just about to say, <laughs> I'm trying to, I love the curse. I'm trying to, I like, I like survival is no longer the legacy that I'm, I'm looking for when I think of a well-rested future. When I sit and imagine and close my eyes and think about what it will be like and what it could be like, um, it looks like people being connected to the deepest parts of themselves. It looks like them knowing without a doubt that they are free and that they are loved and that they are valuable no matter what any um, external thing could say. It's a deep internal love. I claim resting in the future of resting as a meticulous love practice. It is a meticulous, meticulous practice yes. of love. 
Yeah, that's that. what I think about. I love that. Well, I just want to say thank you because every time I lay down for a nap, <laughs> I think of you. Or any <laughs> or yeah, any time, so any time I have that little negotiation in my head where I'm like, should I rest yeah. or should I go do something? And I'm like, what would what would list, the nap right. bishop say right now? She was right here. Yeah. What would she say? What would the nap bishop say? <laughs> go lay your ass down. <laughs> what would the nap bishop do? I would I would get you a pillow. I would get you a little blanket. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get some little well, instance for you. I will have you together. Yeah. Yes. Well, I appreciate you and your work. I appreciate you so much. Thanks for having me on. Hi, Trisha. Thank you so much for coming on Become a Good Ancestor. Your work is revolutionary. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've been loving your book and I've been loving listening to you and Layla chat. And it's it really is so profound, the philosophy and the work you are doing. So thank you. Thank you so much for reading. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. It was it really blew up and <clears throat> blew up in my mind the concept of reclaiming the rest and peace and dream space. It's really Yes. Yeah, and it, you know, as you were talking about, without rest, we cannot tap into and access imagination and creativity yeah. and the deepest the deepest aspects of you know, intellectual curiosity and potential, all of that is intertwined. And when a person is denied rest, they're denied a huge part of their humanity. Absolutely. This is a human rights issue. This is this work is um resting and sleeping and naps is a, is a human right. It's, it is our human right. It is our divine right. And so I love that you tapped into that because it is a global idea. It's this idea of getting us back, like I told Layla, to our humanness, right. to being more human, mm-hmm. you know, to tapping into our natural state, the state of who we, what we were placed on this earth to be. And so yeah. that is really um, my goal. I love that. And it reminded me as well, you know, it's uh, like modern day and contemporary slavery of, you know, children and child labor and other parts of, the world where they're being denied their their uh, potential because they're being used for work at such an early age and to feed back into this, you know, white supremacist capitalistic culture that does not want us to thrive, let alone even survive, because it's cutting off huge chunks of our humanity. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I because my. My exploration of this is your book, and it's so profound, and we're so excited to introduce it to our community. I wanted to ask you specifically, as one writer to another, what was the most uh, transformational as well as challenging aspect of writing this very particular book in this very particular time where we find ourselves in? I know. That's such a good question. Yeah, I think that they're one in the same, you know, the, the transformation was in the challenge. You know, I was writing, I was talking to a lot of my friends and we were talking about how we've survived the pandemic and like we're so far still into it and like what it left behind in us and what it was like, you know, remembering the early stages of the pandemic when it was like full on trauma, like there wasn't tissue, people didn't know, people didn't have masks, you were trying, family members were sick, people were dying. It was like, all these things that are still happening, it was just like trying to make space and make a way in this new system that we were seeing develop in front of us. Like this global pandemic that no one had any type of idea what was going to happen and what it would be. I remember when the pandemic first started and I was getting um, people being like, okay, we'll just... um." We're just going to cancel this for about two weeks. We'll we'll come back together in two weeks. Everything will be good. <laughs> it was like everything will be yeah, good. Like, we I'll have, see you we in have a no bit. clue. Like everything will be good. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Like hey, there's something going on, you know. But give, give it about two weeks, and we'll get back on the calendar to reschedule. And then now we are where we are now, almost three years, and we're like still in it. And so the naivety and like the not knowing of what would be, but I literally got a book deal right during this time. So I got signed to have a book deal right in the middle of the pandemic. And so that alone was um, very stressful. It was so exciting. But then to think that I have to sit and write while I'm like literally having full on anxiety, yeah. you know, like my entire family had COVID at the same time. My mom, who's in her 70s, my sister, my brother-in-law, my two, three nieces, they all were like 
deeply ill with the pandemic. And, and it was just like, okay, you got the deadline, get that other chapter in. It's like, chapter in? I'm like worried about my mom. Like, I don't want her. She's an elder. She has um, pre existing conditions and I couldn't go and be with her. So I was like sending groceries to her house and on the phone and just like the stress of trying to not keep my son from being sick. My son was um, in junior high at the time. And so he went totally virtual. So he's in the class, he's on his computer. I'm in my office trying to write, calling my mother to make sure she's okay, worried about her being sick and helping, making sure my son didn't catch COVID. So it was super, super stressful. People were saying that they could barely even return a phone call during the pandemic. That's how much stress it was put on our bodies. And here I was writing a book. So it was like the most challenging thing. Like I love to write, but to write during those times really was... um. A nightmare for me. But then at the same time, there were so many moments because I love to write and I trust my voice and I understand writing to be a spiritual practice that there were so many times where I took to um, writing and I began to just listen and I began to just sit and think about collaborate. I wanted my ancestors and God to collaborate with me on this. I was like, y'all going to have to help because you see what's going on. So I need your collaboration. And so put the words into my mouth, put the, let the ideas come to me. A lot of the book Rima I um, wrote actually speaking it through voice notes. So I would be in the tub taking a bath and I would, an idea would always come to me when I was in the water. I love baths. They're so restful. And so I would be in the bath and a, a idea of a paragraph or a chapter would come to me. The form of the book would come to me. And so I would just begin to speak it on voice notes. So I have hundreds of voice notes of me just, you can hear the water splash in the background. <laughs> and it's me being like, add this to page 10. You know, like, what about, you know, telling these right. stories about my dad and mm -hmm. trying to like really uncover what I wanted to say for the book. So there was a lot of just journaling and uncovering. And so that was really transformational to be able to have that time to dig deep into the moments that my body and my mind and spirit would allow for me to be able to write. And so there were moments when I wouldn't write for literally months. And then there were moments when I would write, like I could write, you know, a hundred pages, you know, over the course of a weekend. So there were, it was very fluid and I didn't have a lot of um exact, times and um outlines i really just wanted the antenna to stay open and i can just like pour it out and think about the form and so i think both was challenging and it was also transformational to be able to tap into the spiritual practice of it because i needed that like that was the only way i was going to be able to write this book during what we were what was happening in our world you know all, what was happening in our lives was that i was going to have to tap into spirit that's beautiful thank you do you think it helped you get through this time Yes, it was so helpful. I think it was helpful because when I first got the book deal and knew I was going to write a book, I always knew that this book is not just for me. I'm, this is a legacy piece. Like I, even during all of the interviews and I was thinking about picking a publisher, it was always like, this is a legacy piece. This is not about me. This is about me, but it's like a, this book has to be a part of the literary canon this manifesto in this field guide has to be a part of our culture. People need this declaration. Like this, the impossible of this has to come to the world. Like, so I really tapped into that a lot, the idea of a legacy. It's, it is resonant and very apparent in your words and your pages. You have written a legacy piece to add to this powerful canon. Thank you so much, Trisha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rima. Thank you, Rima. That was beautiful, Trisha. And thank you for what you've contributed to this literary canon. This is the book that we need. This is the book that we've been needing. <laughs> this is the yes. book that will that will guide us into the future that we all want. Um, we're so grateful for you. Um, as we close up, I want to ask you our final question. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to be a good ancestor? Yeah. It means to stay aligned to who I am, no matter what. It means to always continue to um, be in alignment, to stay open to being um, to being guided. Like I trust um, the guidance in my life. I trust um, the creator and my ancestors to be a guide to me. And so I always want to not get off track. I always don't want to go to the external. I don't want to go to the the outside, I always want to stay centered and um, aligned and flowing and stay in that space. Because if I stay in that space and, and be very deeply connected to my intuition and listening, 
I believe that um, I will be a good ancestor. I believe I am on the track to making that way, you know, to being open and connected and um, staying true. Like, like how you said, staying true to who I am, whose I am. Like that yes. is how I will be a good ancestor. I'll stay true to what I know to what, what, what is me, that it is a deep divine miracle that I'm here. And so because of that, I'm going to stay keeping it uplifted. And you're doing it. You're doing it. And you're inspiring so many of us. Thank you so much for for being um, being who you are, being who you are here to be, um, yeah. it, you know, in honor of your ancestors, in honor of those who will come after you're gone. Um, for those of us who are here now who get to be alive and to witness your um, your praxis, your thought leadership, your um guiding of us. Uh, it, it's it's truly a privilege to know you and to to get to be a beneficiary of your work. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. So beautiful. It's been such a beautiful experience and moment. I'm so grateful for your support and for you reaching out and for your work and speaking with authors and uplifting the idea of being a good ancestor. It's so important. It's like so needed in our culture to, to think about, to have this framework, to begin to even be curious about it, to begin mm. to wonder, to have that wondering about what that could be and what it is. So I yeah. appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to our listeners, I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation. Please buy this book. This is the book that you need. Yes. Please buy this book. We are an overworked, overtired world right? And and we need this. We need this. It has guided so much of my practice. How I show up in the world, I think, has been, I've been able to show up more and more in, in who I am here to be because of this practice, and I'm grateful for it. Um, I also want to let folks know this is actually our last episode of 2022, and what a privilege it is to end with Trisha and this conversation we will be closing down for the rest of the year so we can rest, right? We, we're taking that practice <laughs> yes. ourselves as a team. I love it. We are going to rest. We want to encourage you to, if you haven't already, to catch up with some of our past episodes from this year. We've interviewed some incredible people like Dante Stewart, Cole Arthur Riley, um, Kate Johnson, uh, so many. And also to check out, if you haven't already, our resources and courses at becomeagoodancestor.com. We have a course on overcoming imposter syndrome so that you can use your voice to change the world and a course called Claim Your Space, which is for aspiring change makers who are ready to become confident change makers. You can find all of that at becomeagoodancestor.com. In the meantime, I wish you a restful rest of 2022 and a beautiful rested entry into 2023. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed learning about today's author and their incredible work. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave us some love with a rating and review. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. And of course, don't forget to buy the book we talked about today. We're on a mission to center and celebrate BIPOC authors, and you can help us do that by sharing this episode and the book. You can join us in our book club to dive deeper into today's book. Visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club to find out more. For more inspiration and learning, you can find us at becomeagoodancestor.com and become underscore a underscore good underscore ancestor on Instagram. Thank you for being on the journey with us as we strive to become good ancestors in honor of those who have come before us and in service to those who will come after we are gone.